Hello everybody and welcome to this Monday Masterclass. Today we are joined by Martine from Husky Studio and we're going to be talking all about branding. So while everybody's coming in and getting settled, um, we have a fun question for you. Um, if you were going to choose a brand colour, what colour would you choose? So do feel free to post that in the chat if you'd like to. Have a think about it. If you immediately, what's the first colour that comes to mind when you think about your brand? Carlos says yellow, obviously very loyal to his own brand. It's <laughs> green, straight in, very, very good. Nice, Jacob. I wonder nice. if, the, you know those little robot-y looking things on Crowdcast that you get if you haven't put your profile picture I wonder if it's just really lucky that Carlos's is yellow. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> he somehow managed to choose that one. Um, that all the says, purple, Mark. Mm, mm. Very nice. <laughs> Excellent stuff. Well, obviously our brand is actually three colours, but we're going to get into that. We're not going to. We're not going to. I don't want to. Green. Mint green. Well, I've, and it's in the background of Kieran's yeah. profile picture. They're very on brand. Very good. Some good colours coming through. Some very nice. good. Uh, Martine, I didn't realise this morning, but I've worn a kind of coloured top, which I now think perhaps I subliminally thought might be appropriate to wear. So I'm interested in what your interpretations are of the colours on my jumper. <laughs> oh, they, yeah, they look um, a little bit more muted than your own brand. But yeah, um, yeah subtle subtle hints of uh, better, bolder, braver. <laughs> I guess so. <laughs> Yeah, okay. very good. Excellent. So to kick us off, um, if you are new to the Crowdcast, then uh, I am Simon, the co-founder of Better, Bolder, Braver. And also in the middle on my screen is Francis as well, uh, the, okay. the co-founder of Better, Bolder, Braver. And then we also have uh, Martine, who is joining us. So in order to kick us off, Martine, do you want to tell us a little bit about... Um, you and your work uh, with Husky Studio. Yeah, sure. So um, Husky Studio is a sort of a micro design agency, if you like. There's three of us, um, originally based in Brighton, but now spread out across the South Coast. Um, and we specialise in in branding, which is how we came to work with you guys, um, but also in sort of web design and basically anywhere that a brand touches in terms of printed or digital. So we think about however... Um, Wherever a brand appears visually, we're often involved with our clients in uh, helping them make more impact or, or, or more or uh, projecting themselves more authentically visually across all the different channels. Yeah, um, that's yeah. really good. It's, it's quite, we have a very broad range of clients from individuals, um, um, sort of, I guess you guys might class as a, as a startup perhaps, um, sort of, you know, two people starting something new. Um, and then right up to sort of uh, small and middle-sized businesses. So we're quite experienced in helping people who are sort of uh, embarking on their first branding project, right up to people who, you know, can write an excellent brief and have done it all before. So we sort of work with a, quite a wide variety of people in terms of experience and size of business. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because we obviously bumped into you at the co-working space. I've known, known Martine for many years through a co-working space and also... Carlos from Happy Startup School, as well as Lawrence, um, have uh, obviously knew you from, from from years back in the the Brighton circle of co-working. Mm. Um, so that's how we came to sort of hear about you. And I've seen many of the projects you've delivered over the years through various other businesses and different, um, yeah, people that just who who I know who've had their branding done. So you've you've def as I can attest to your your large range of clients, <laughs> yeah, uh, definitely in different sectors as well. Um, there's another one that immediately springs to mind was the uh, truth paste. It's a really good one. Yes, uh, yeah. A sort of ev everything from vegan toothpaste to um, yeah. you know big corporates doing sort of technical stuff. So it's yeah, it's a broad range. But I, I guess um, and that's interesting actually because a lot of people ask us, you know, what sector do you work in? And mm. it's it's quite broad at the moment. But um, what's nice about our process is that allows us to sort of dig deep into you know what a brand's really about no matter what sector they're in and and so it doesn't bother us too much working in a new sector because we can sort of use our process to get under the skin of what you know those different businesses uh how they want to project themselves and 
what their audience are interested in. So in a way, it, we're um, agnostic about, you know, what industry someone's in when we start working with them. Mm. So what is it about um, branding that you, that, that like, if you, if I was to come to you and say, why do I need a brand? What is it about a brand that, that you think is sort of needed from a, from a sort of business point of view, even if you're just talking about someone who's working on their own? Mm, you know, sure. What is it about a brand? Well, I think branding more broadly is more about just visuals. It's about how you act, how you talk and how you look. And they should all be in sync. But I guess um, as a designer, the principal thing that I'm involved in is the visual part of that brand. And um, the reason why I think it's so important is it really form it's your first impression. And then as you go on to interact with people, people connect how you act with your brand and then they're reminded of that. So, um, you know, just like you remember a face, you would remember, you know, a color or a logo or an icon and become recognizable. And especially, I, I imagine with them, um, with coaches, if if your main source of getting people to work with you perhaps is on Instagram, it's a crowded marketplace and it's extremely yeah. visual. So um, it's a way that you can use to stand out in that crowd and be recognisable uh, um, among a huge amount of visual clutter. Um, so having something that's really unique and really reflects you is, you know, is a competitive advantage. Um, because people will sort of gravitate towards you because they recognise you. And if you have a brand that's been designed sensitively to what makes you tick and, and thinking about the kind of audience you want to connect with, then it's going to resonate with the right people and draw them to you. Mm. I've got a couple of things that have come to mind to mention at this point. And one is that Simon and I have, have both come with 20 years of marketing experience mm -hmm. respe respectively. And I think we don't, we didn't ever have a conversation about whether we did or didn't need branding. We, there weren't a lot of startup costs for us, mm. but one of the one of the costs, and not to say it was uh, prohibitive at all, was working with you. And we didn't even bat an eyelid. It just seemed like uh, like the thing that we needed to do really early on, and neither mm. of us questioned it. It was just like, right, so yeah. we'll be doing our branding in week three or something like mm. that. Um, and then also what you've just been talking to is something that I think is really important to us, which is the kind of, we, we talk about the levels of consciousness that our coaches might like to think about when they work with their clients. And equally for us, I think we are very aware of, of this kind of um, journey, <laughs> existential journey or kind of meaning journey that people mm. will go on when they work with us and, and for us branding needs to be sensitive to that so that people get a real subliminal unconscious sense of where they're going to go in terms of their confidence from what they're going to be greeted with as a brand when they start to hear what we have to say which might be a very gently softly softly approach mm. talking about their marketing yeah I think that's right I mean um the a visual brand should start to give you a few clues about what you're going to get when you start interacting with this brand you know are they going to be sort of and you know i mean i think your brand is quite energetic and confident and um those are things you know you guys obviously put a lot of energy in into into the community but it also speaks about the kind of confidence that people who work with you can hopefully hopefully gain so it's kind of um putting its money where its mouth is in terms of a brand you know it's projecting the things that you want to give to your to your audience so mm. that's so kind of you and i'm glad that you have i that you it's not just from what we said to you at the beginning but that it's the feelings that you get from working with us and I'm yeah glad to say they do we are trying I, to we're showing up as you have mm. branded us you know yeah I, mean? I, I think so and that's really important actually being authentic because um there's a difference between words you might write down about how you want to be perceived and then there might be different words that perhaps how you are perceived or how you know that there can be a gap sometimes and you need mm. to make sure that when you're thinking about the kind of words you want people to associate with you that they are genuine to you and how you work because people can sniff it out a mile off if you're mm. pretending to be one thing through your brand and then um actually the, how you present when you work with people is very different so the more genuine more authentic you can be in how you're representing yourself the more that will resonate with people 
So there's no point in pretending to be this, it's something you're not essentially, you know. Mm. Um, so yeah, I think that being authentic about who you are, but then representing it is, is really important. It's something I try to um, work with clients to, to figure out, you know, what are they saying because they think it's what they should be and what, what they genuinely want, uh, should project because that's how they are, you know. Mm. And that's so in the spirit of what we're all about. And we talk about um, marketing as an opportunity to hold a mirror up to yourself. Mm. And also, as coaches, we suggest to our community members that they're very well placed to do marketing because they're so good at asking questions of other people. But in Mm. theory, then asking questions of themselves. And as you say, it's that thing of you need to make some decisions about what you want to say about yourself. And then also... I think you're holding yourself to account, in fact, mm. when you have a brand, because you you keep you you keep coming back to what you represent. And you know we've been talking to Carlos and Lawrence recently about our manifesto, as it were. And in a way, your brand really sort of is a mirror of what your manifesto is, what you stand for, and you know what you want people to know you for. So um, yeah, I, I think it's also something to measure yourself against, you know, to to keep coming back to and making sure that you're being consistent as well. Because something that if you want to have a strong brand, you want to be consistent to it, whether that's in use of colours or language. And then if if you're able to develop even a basic brand guidelines and then and then stick to that, then your message becomes more consistent, and then that people feel uh, more likely to trust you really because you're not this mm. sort of. Uh, multifaceted sort of uh schizophrenic brand you know you mm. you kind of um always singing from the same hinge hymn sheet in terms of visuals and everything else so Absolutely. it just comes across as more genuine if you can be consistent yeah yeah and i think one of the things that always frustrates me about <clears throat> some brands is or, or the lack of brand is that sometimes it's hard to tell whether the same person is behind the social who is emailing you who's made the website who's on LinkedIn Mm. and it's just those subtle things of it without a like a consistency it's hard to build trust and with coaches that's incredibly important because you're Mm. potentially at a point of asking someone to open up to you or to trust you to guide them to something so if they want to you know come to an outcome feeling or insight and you know, sometimes it takes them a long time to get to that point to be like, I need to change. They want to trust someone who's going to help them get to where they want to go. Now, someone who's a bit muddled and Mm. inconsistent in just their emails, you know, that immediately is signaling, uh, even if subconsciously to the client, this person is a bit off and they're a bit on and they're a bit off and they're a bit on. They're not quite here. They're not quite there. Sometimes it's this, sometimes it's that. Where do I fit in that? And it can be hard. Whereas even if you just use the same font and put your logo on everything, you know, even as like level one, then at least everything they get is just, oh, yeah, this is definitely from this person. This is definitely from this person. I feel like I fit into this. And they basically, they've got their shit together so I can trust them to help me get my shit together. If yeah, there's, I mean. a, there's a level of professionality that you're trying to... Um, I mean, I don't think anyone would want to be perceived as unprofessional. And mm. and um, it, it's funny, actually, one of the questions we often ask clients as part of our discovery process is what three words would you like people to sort of use to describe you? And often people say professional. And actually, I always challenge that because I'm like, who wouldn't want to be seen as professional? Mm. And what you really want to identify are three words that are really unique to you that not every other coach would use. Um, but that's, you know, one of the things we sort of challenge people, okay, professional, trustworthy, definitely, because they're almost a given, but what are the mm. unique words to you? But yeah, you being consistent about, how, how, about that is really important. That's making me think about when you have um, uh, kids and you provide uh, clear boundaries within mm-hmm. which they can pl- be playful um so i think we're giving up we're giving ourselves permission to be playful with our marketing and how we interact with people because people can keep coming back to the stability and the clarity uh of our brand which is consistent so um if we were sort of less clear in our visual uh communication we might think we need to be much more professional and less playful in our message 
but because yeah. we are confident in how we're showing up visually people uh you know sort of understand that we have license to be a bit playful and and sort of light lighter hearted yes, yeah. in some of our appro- other approaches which is really important to us so um hopefully people are starting to see it's similar to niching and that you know when you first start thinking about it i think people find niching to be quite a difficult uh one to get their heads around because they feel like they're cutting off their nose to spite their face and i think Mm. people might have a similar sort of um unconscious relationship with branding in that they think they can do it without thinking too much about it and it all it's not that important And also that, in fact, if they wed themselves to a particular visual identity, they may actually be limiting themselves in some way. But what we would like people to have from this conversation is actually that it can free you up by having a strong brand. Um, So, you know, one of the things we thought we might do in the spirit of us always being transparent about how we're building this business is actually take people through our own brand guidelines with you. Um, And so that's the prompt for us to be able to articulate our thinking and and how you helped us with it Mm. but it's also a really good way I think for people to see what brand guidelines look like because if you haven't had any professional help Mm. with your brand then brand guidelines won't mean anything to you nobody will know what that actually looks like or or can help with it so you thank you in advance because you yeah yeah, of course sorry Sorry, what what, what I was going to say is before we look at the brand guidelines might it be useful to understand where we started and then see where we ended up or do you want to go where we ended up and then talk about how we got there which way do you want to do it I I think we could talk a little bit about what we did before we created the brand maybe because it might be interesting yeah Yeah. because it's like the kind of well what idea do we have and then what is because the brand guide is essentially what what you get delivered at the end that is um, when you work with a wonderful professional they give you the brand guide and they give you a big pack of logo files and fonts and, da, 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 and all this sort of stuff which is the end but actually the beginning bit is often the hardest bit for a lot of people I think because you end up with this this sort of thing of like well I don't know what I want so how can I ask someone to for them to make me that brand guideline and logo when I don't know necessarily how to articulate what I want so I mean me and Francis obviously worked with several I mean I've been doing working with small businesses for 20 years. So I have been through the branding machine many, many times um, to some good success and to some other, like you just wonder where on earth the client's going, but it's a personal (laughs) thing, branding. So sometimes you just have to let them go off and do their own thing. But both me and Francis have worked on some, you know, big branding projects. So we, we sort of had the experience of how to articulate what we wanted. So we sort of leapfrogged a little bit with you didn't we because we Mm. kind of came to you with well this is this is what we want but let's wind it back for coaches who may be sitting watching this thinking okay you know i I get why i need a brand but what's that first step How, how do they go about articulating what they want yeah sure so yeah as you say with you um i received an unusually really good brief (laughs) so um you know you were very thorough about the kind of people you were trying to speak to the kind of qualities you wanted to project um the only uh uh part of the brief that i had to quantify with you or or check with you was actually you both referenced some um some style things that you liked and when i looked at them some of them were at odds with each other which was quite funny but what was great about that is i could come back to you and question it and then together we figured out what it was and Mm. you know something that was consistent between you that you liked and so that's always a challenge actually when you're working with more than one client if you like to make sure everyone's on the same page but um, equally, when you're working with an individual, I still need to make sure I'm on the same page as you. So that mm-hmm. first part of the process is me uh, understanding, you know, what your business is about, the core services you're offering, uh, what sort of values you have, and also really trying to get a clear picture of who your audience is, who are the people you're going to be coaching and what will appeal to them. Um, one question I really like to ask is how do you want your client to feel when they've when they've used your service and I really like those questions that speak about emotion so you know how do they feel before they've used your service and how do they feel afterwards because then we start to think about you know how can we create a 
a brand that is starts to help people feel a certain way so with you you know you talked about um people feeling empowered and more confident and um we've tried to create a brand that feels very confident and um it's very sort of, it's quite lively and you know you're creating a community where there's hopefully lots of interaction so we try and reflect the sort of end result if you like um you know if you want people to feel a certain way it's good to keep that in your head as something you want to reflect in the brand we also ask people to think about um especially if someone already has a brand um and i'm sure some of your coaches might have branding and then wonder if it's right so often when we're looking at a rebrand we'll ask people um how do you think you're perceived now and how do you want to be perceived but we try and do that on a scale um with certain qualities so um often people say oh we want to be perceived as serious for example and um what i find is is very hard to be black and white about serious not serious so we try and find sort of opposites so maybe it's serious versus fun and we plot on on a scale where do you think you are now between these two qualities and where do you want to move to and that gives me a lot more um shades of gray if you like to figure out um it, it's it's not a it's not a binary decision is what i'm saying so often that that reveals the nuances of where people think they are um sort of on different scales between different qualities and then obviously my job is to try and um convert those qualities which are words into a sort of a visual feel and i guess that's where my expertise is is sort of converting those you know the language we're using to describe and think about your brand into something that translates visually of course when you create something visual different people do take different things from it and it's a very subjective thing but the good thing about having a good brief at the start and asking all these questions is that there's something that we can come back to and measure the results of what a designer does against that brief so i can mm. and i constantly check my work back against okay we said we wanted to feel empowering or inspirational and then i can try and look back at my work and subjectively but try and look back at the work and think okay does this feel empowering so it's a good way for me to measure the success of something but also um yeah for everyone to have one point of uh of truth if you like for what we're trying to achieve mm. and the, the other really important part of that is not just what do you want to project but what do um your audience want to see and um obviously you've got a bit of a problem if they're very different things mm. um so it's it's really useful to if you have this relationship with perhaps existing clients to talk to them about how they you know what words would you use to describe us or what is it that you really love about working with us and that information is really useful in terms of knowing what how they perceive you and and you know um whether you need to change that slightly or whether you just learn from that and want to attract more of the same kind of people it's mm. sort of useful to understand your audience well in terms of what they're looking for. Mm. Yeah, and I uh, think there's a lot of... Oh, oh sorry, Francis. I was, I was going to say, um, I'm sure sort of uh, as marketing people, you know, that's something you would understand your audience is sort of core really to, to marketing, mm. whether you're sort of um, doing targeted Facebook ads or just trying to understand who you're talking to. So... Um, yeah, that's what, a lot where design and marketing cross over a little bit, I think, in, in understanding the audience. And it's just the outputs that are slightly different. You know? mm. Yeah, and I think understanding your client is key. And I think even if you're just starting out as a coach, you know, you've got an idea of who you'd like to work with mm. and you can just use that. Because obviously when we came to you, we had, you know, we hadn't even launched the community. There was no, there's nothing really there except this sort of document saying, we want to speak to these sorts of people about this and this is how we want them to feel. And in doing, I guess, in, in, in articulating that, you know, you very quickly highlighted that me and Francis had a very slight difference in our visual sort of cues for that. Mm. But actually that was really great because it, it forced us to look at that again and both sit down and go, well, mm. hang on, what what is it about this? And what is it about that that we like? And why do we think this is good? Like, what is it about that? thing that you think is saying this and vice versa mm, mm. and then we came back to you i think with a much more sort of concise and uh, aligned uh, yes. visual reference 
Um, but obviously, so we sort of jumped the gun in a, in a few ways because we knew, obviously, I've been sort of building websites and doing the odd bit of, <clears throat> I'm not, I'm not going to call it design, I'm going to call it assembly of design assets into different things. Um, so we knew I, I had certain requirements for colours and fonts to make my life easier in like, yes. I'm going to make the website, I'm going to do this, so I need these elements so I can just do that. I can just drag that on there and I'm not going to have to adjust it or do it. So, so we kind of came with some technical requirements. Yeah, actually, that, that's an important point of technical requirements, because aside from understanding your, your own brand and your own values and then your audience, there are some very practical things that you need to know about your brand. You know, where are you going to be using it? And, you know, is it in print or is it online? If you're on social media, you know, you need to think about how your um, icon perhaps will work in, you know, in a sort of square or a circular avatar. Um, and then, yeah, think about the places you're going to be using a brand. Um, you know, something people uh, or we think about a lot is how a logo works at different sizes and for different uses. And sometimes you need several versions of a logo to work in, you know, a very small place or, or somewhere where you've got more space. So understanding those technical requirements, if you like, are, are really important. It makes it much easier. We just um, we've been asked to run a signature course for the Association for Coaching. And so they needed things in a particular format. Mm. And I found myself having to send our logo in a circular format, which is something that we don't normally tend to use. And it was so easy because it was there because it was in the library. It was in the suite of stuff that you'd already provided yes. to us. And it was so easy. It made my life so much easier, both of our lives so much easier. Before we move into anything te too technical, I just want to reflect on one thing which you said which I thought was absolutely fascinating and then Simon echoed it as well which is almost like a kind of it's like you're a relationship counsellor you know you come in and you you make people have to work and you know Simon and I luckily get on incredibly well and also from the get-go we've had very healthy conversations which are very honest about our needs and our wants and our wishes and how we work and you know we've been very honest with each other but you know that was an example of where we one might have made the assumption that the other person was very much singing from the same hymn sheet and then lo and behold we had quite different tastes and being able to come together and and talk about what was important for us about those things and and therefore to air our differences or air our the nuances of our opinion at that early stage of forming a business was so useful I don't know if I if we pay it as much credit as perhaps we should in in terms of how good our relationship is now um and yeah I just wanted to sort of pay tribute to the sort of counseling that you can mm. do I guess <laughs> along the way I'm mm. sure whether it's as you say somebody who you know co-worker co-founders or if somebody's looking to transition from one state of affairs to another mm. and and to hold their hand in that emotional journey and get them to really drill down on what it is they stood for how people see them and what they want to be seen as moving forward is quite an emotional journey so I just wanted to to say that at this point yeah I, I think I mean communication is key always in all areas of life but it's it's very key certainly for for what we do and you know um two people with a um, slightly different views on something is, is quite common but I often get briefs where one individual has opposing views in the same brief so <laughs> it's something I'm quite used to dealing with um, but you know part of my job is not just putting um, you know digital pen to paper it, it's about um, helping someone through the brief process and building a brief because a lot of people haven't done a design brief before and that sort of workshop process and helping someone understand a bit who they are and how they want to be perceived is part of my job so I, I very much see it as, as part of the design process so if someone's thinking oh I don't know what I stand for or I don't know you know I've sort of design exercises and run workshops with my clients to help them get clearer on how they want to be perceived or get clearer on you know their their sort of visual qualities or, or their values um so it's great when they've already um done thinking about that it, it makes it uh, quicker and easier but it's also something we sort of do to try and help people because not everyone comes with a fully formed idea and mm. um I, i'm fine with that you know uh yeah it's it's part of the process to get clear on what you need and what you want to present yourself as yeah i mean i think i'd, I'd 
like to share a little something sort of from the from the I guess customer side of things so as an agency we don't do in-house design we've always used external designers and we have what should we call let's politely say a range of designers some designers we can take a thing to so it's like I need you to make this and it's like that is the thing I need you to make and if you ask them to can you try and like give us something this and, and we go through that process you've just described of trying mm. to articulate it, it just that their, their strength is not there and you just end up with five very similar variations of the first idea they had whereas designers like Martine are very good at you know taking someone's description of what how they want someone to feel and coming up with something that you wouldn't have thought of even if you'd sat down for years on end and scribbled out all of your ideas there's just a creative spark in the work our team does that is is different to other designers so i think one of the things i'm trying to say there is also thank you martin but also it is that you shouldn't necessarily think that just because you've seen a designer do something well for one person means it's going to work for you there's definitely a a a vibe there that you have to get on and they have to be on that same wavelength as you because we knew um early on that that we needed someone who was going to be able to turn this into something that we couldn't have come up with ourselves because otherwise we would just i think i'm speaking a little bit for Francis here i feel like we would have just tried to shape it whereas what we did is we gave you a brief and then complete freedom to do something because mm. I think one of the things I've learned over the years is if you try and do a bit of the work up front I find it really clouds and impacts the design whereas it's better yeah. just to go I want people to feel like this when they look at it and that's the name mm. have you got any ideas and that's let, yeah let the creativity um, come I have to say that's the most exciting brief for me is is one where you get creative freedom um, mm. and you do get the full range from I've done a sketch of what I want my logo to look like can you make it look nice to yeah. um, here's the name, here's what we stand for, go create. And obviously I love that creative freedom and um, I find it really exciting um, being at the start of someone's journey and being a very small part, but being a part of uh, their success and how they present themselves and going on that journey with someone to um, right at the start. When, you know, when people start a, a new venture, they're so excited and enthusiastic about what they're doing. And often they have loads of ideas and I'm all for taking the ideas. You know, if you have a, vi a visual idea or something that you love, I always like people to share it because um, it's also very difficult to design for someone who says, um, I'll know what I like when I see it, or um, that's that's sort of a red flag. Mm. <laughs> or, um, or, yeah, I've got some ideas, but I'm not going to tell you what they are. I just, you know, like if you have ideas, it's good to see, like, for example, I know you guys listed some websites that um, you thought work well, and that was useful to get on the same wavelength as you. But then after that, I had sort of creative freedom to come back with some ideas. And that, that was really nice. I think if you don't give that creative freedom, you kind of not using the full value of, of the designer, you know, mm. um, if you're cutting down the options right from the start, mm. um, the designer becomes more of an art worker than, than someone yeah. who can bring creative value for you. Mm. Also, I think it kind of, I'm thinking back to that time in the pub, Simon, where apart from anything else, we were, we were actually able to meet up in real life, <laughs> which was quite nice. But when we got our brand guidelines, which we'll come to mm. in a minute, um and just having them there having printed them out and like being able to look and feel mm. them in our hands look at them feel them in our hands and say this is it this is real like mm. this thing that we are birthing is actually happening in front of our eyes and you know that comes from the creative uh freedom that you had where you were giving the gift to us of this thing that we had just you know had just been like twinkles in our mind and then mm. there it was you were giving that to us it was like the mark of mm. actual almost the birth bit it was yeah. so exciting we, so nice we've arrived we've got a brand we've got it yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So i think that's it because it was like before it was just we had a domain name and that was and an idea it. yeah and an idea and then all <laughs> yeah. of a sudden it's like hang on now we can put colors we can put fonts we can mm. we can do all this stuff but i think mm. now is the time for Martine to reveal the brand guidelines. I think this, this would be a great time to go through them because yeah, sure. essentially that point we were at. So 
we said yes to the brand and then it's like right now what do i do how do i go about making a website <clears throat> where do i put my logo how big is it what font do i use what colors are they this is what brand guidelines give you so martin do you want to sort of show us through these uh, brand guides and then we can we can sort of talk around what these what these uh, sort of how if you talk through them i can sort of reflect a bit on where we use them yeah of course yeah so i think you can see my screen now yes we can so i expect a lot of um, people on here will recognize parts of it because you've been <laughs> using it um you know through your social media and, and other mm. channels but um one of the key things um well the, i guess i should talk about the key component parts to this brand guidelines which is quite brief but um it, it's it's also quite flexible and i think that's important so you're giving consistency but also flexibility because you don't want to paint yourself into a box but the key things that we cover in this are the logo and how to use it fonts and color palette and with this brand we ended up um developing a set of shapes so um someone's just said i need to be painted into a box <laughs> yeah well, it's I a think, delicate balance probably... <laughs> exactly. I think it's probably worth saying that we actually did ask Martine essentially for almost a brand toolkit. Mm. So it was all of the elements of the brand that we could then go away and layer up. As I said earlier, I'm I'm sort of fairly au fait with brand assembly, if you will, of yeah. if I've got the right tools to work with, I can put stuff together that looks on brand, as you would say. Um, we didn't need kind of an Instagram post designing a story post. Yes. We didn't need all of those things that sometimes you, you, you can get from a designer. Yes, absolutely. So, yeah. yeah. I mean, sometimes we do create things like social media post templates or, you know, mm. that kind of thing. So I guess you can kind of brief your designer on, on um, based on your own experience of dealing with this kind of stuff, how much, um, how much flexibility you want and how much you just want to know exactly how something should look. Yes, exactly. Um, yeah. yeah. So um, this is sort of an introduction to the logo, really. And on its own, it's, I mean, it's very simple and, and quite bold. But um, we're, when we actually, when we had our face-to-face -face chat and I met Francis for the first time and you told me the name and um, I sort of, one of the first things I start doing is sort of uh, writing it down in different form, you know, in different sort of letter forms. And one of the things I think I said to you is like, well, this is a bit of a gift. All of the words mm. have got the same amount of letters um, and that makes a very nice grid. And it's also very helpful for um, a logo that works well on social in terms of creating very square shape. So, um, yeah, so that that was quite nice. Um, often with logos, you get a little gift in terms of the letters, mm. the letter forms, and sometimes there's something interesting you can do with those. We um, and also because um, so my background is that I did graphic design before I then did uh, cultural theory and sociology and then art history. So mm. like my my first uh, foray into sort of uh, having done a bit of art at school and something a bit more serious was understanding the kind of got connotations and denotations of kind of word and image and color and shape and what i was so excited about at this point was that what you had worked out was this kind of matrix of all the letters that you know what it communicated uh was how it was kind of very tidy but within within the letters there was this invitation to see you know everybody wants to kind of see if they can see words within that and um, patterns. And that's kind of how what we invite people to have a relationship with marketing like. It, it was, mm. I'm not being very articulate, but I, <laughs> I loved that what you had discovered uh, immediately resonated with me as a kind of metaphorical symbol of what it is that we're trying to get people to mm -hmm. to play with. So yeah, I was, I was really pleased at that point. I think what was also quite nice for me, because you've picked three words that you're essentially saying, this is how you want your audience to feel. So that gave us a bit more freedom in terms of um, perhaps iconography and, and colour to be uh, more simple about it, because we didn't need to communicate quite so much in, you know, we don't need to have an, a, a very overt descriptive icon to go with it mm. so yeah. we were allowed able with the color to really reflect the, the boldness and the braveness in in color and be really bold with color and i remember showing you some colors and you were like can we turn it up some more mm. and that was really fun because sometimes 
people are quite um, conservative or worried about being too too bold. But you know, we turned it right up to eleven on the colour, and I yeah. think that's great. Yeah, that um, was my first first reaction on the first colour palette. It was like this is this is the right direction, but I want them to literally jump out of the screen at me. I, <laughs> I want this to feel like I need sunglasses to look at. That was well, that, that's that, I think we achieved that. Yeah. yeah, that's my measure. I was like, this has got to be. You know, bold is in the brand, but we need to have like sunglasses worthy levels of colour here. Yeah, and I think we were also doing quite a lot of market research at the time, and and one of the things that we really felt was that coaches were sort of trying to be a little bit too much like each other and seeing a lot of uh, sort of, I don't want to be in any way offensive, but relatively innocuous colours or innocuous mm. imagery uh, that was sort of soft, gentle and kind of, uh, you know, very sort of, you could argue empathetic, but not necessarily standing out over and mm. above each other. And, you know, I think what we're trying to infuse in people is a sense that you can be different and that's okay and mm. confident and... You know, yeah, it can it can give you some standout. I mean, there's sort of two approaches. You can can really try and stand out from the crowd, or you can try and fit in with them, and, and both have advantages mm. in different contexts. Mm. For example, mm. hot chocolate is always purple because everyone expects hot chocolate packaging to be purple, <laughs> mm. and that's an example where new hot chocolate people normally follow the trend. But then, if you were to come in with something completely different, you would stand out. You just want to make sure you stand out for the right reasons. <laughs> yes, yes, yeah, that's very true. I think um, also, mm. like with with colour, sometimes it's just important to think about how you're going to use it. So yes. one of my requirements was that it has to work with white on top of it. So, for example, yes. some yellows don't work with white on top mm. and some sort of very bright blues don't because there's yeah, just not enough true. visual contrast. And, so, and I definitely yeah. did tweak the colours to make sure they had enough contrast. Mm. Um, and I think, I can't remember if we sort of established some rules about um, what we could put over colour to make sure that it re remained readable, which is obviously really important. Yeah, um, I mean, it was a big factor yeah. for me because I was thinking of making, you know, right, if I'm going to make a header for a website or I'm going to make a social post, I want to be able to use this colour as the background. Yes. But I don't want to lose white text over it because I don't no. always want to use black text over it. So we, we you know, but... Essentially, yeah, that was all of the brief I gave you, wasn't it? It was just like, there you go, you know, that's the requirement. Now you yeah. can have fun with the palette. Yes, exactly. Because I definitely remember sort of uh, tweaking the yellow uh, to make to, to make sure there's some other colours in there to, mm. um, to make sure that it's sort of dark enough. Um, and we actually created this secondary palette as well. So to give you a bit more flexibility, but I'll just I'll skip back to where I was. So um, what I always try and do, even if it's on a very basic level, is give you some guidance about how to use the logo. So how much space to leave around it. Um, and if there's, you know, if you've got more than one version of the logo, when you should and shouldn't use it. Um, and that just gives you a, a little bit of a, a small rude rule, rule box to make sure that you're not having, having ha spent the money on having something designed, you're using it in the best way. Um, and uh, yeah, in terms of fonts, um, it's always good to, to know the fonts in your brand and then try and use them as consistently as possible. Something to think about here is if you're using the fonts in a particular program to make sure that they can be used. Um, and if your designer purchases a font, you might need licenses for it. So often, and I know it was one of your requirements, was to make sure that the font was a Google font um, because it's freely available and mm. um, can be installed on any computer and um, yeah. you, know, you can certainly well, and also someone for our that. website loads in Google fonts really yes. easily it's, it's it's a couple of clicks and the fonts loaded in whereas with some of the Adobe fonts you have to install all sorts of other yeah. stuff to make the fonts work and I was just like it's, it's just more work so I wanted to keep it simple and it, it, it's not necessarily just because I wanted to make the building of the website easier but thinking long term I'm like well if someone else starts to look after the website in a couple of years' time, I don't mm. want them to have to have this knowledge of how to handle this. And I think trying to trying to future-proof that in a way of just saying, if these fonts are really easy to get hold of and easy to use for everybody, you know, like, and Google fonts mm. are available in Canva, Google, Google fonts are available in uh, most email yeah. software and MailChimp, just out of the box. So yeah, that's a great point. It enables so consistency, doesn't it? If if it's yeah. some yeah. yeah. 
we're even quite geeky about the fact or rather we're dedicated to consistency uh in our sort of private practice if you like in that you know our google docs that we actually use between us are all um set up so that they incorporate you'll be pleased to hear the brand fonts mm. because um i mean firstly you just don't know when you might need to very quickly share something with someone externally yeah. but also i think sort of subconsciously it makes us very very sort of au fait comfortable at one with our fonts because mm. we're using them all the time so, yeah 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 definitely now what we've got next yeah um obviously it's really important if you define the colors to um to know exactly what they are and I always define them in RGB for screen, CMYK for print and um, hex value as well and then that covers all the different uses you'd need um, and yeah so that you don't have to go around sort of color picking the color from somewhere or you know um, mm. approximating it um, again it's a point on consistency but you'd be surprised how often people need a particular colour reference for example if you're having something printed um, perhaps you just or you were getting say a tote bag made mm -hmm. and um, the printer asks you well what's the you know what's the reference for the colour of bag you want and to have this all written down in one place you can come back to means that you don't have to guess or approximate or get them to mm -hmm. convert something from the wrong colour value or you know yeah. so it's just I've yeah. I've had a tale of why with this. We've had 5,000 business cards printed with um, <clears throat> a hex value mm. rather than a CMYK value. Yeah. And it was the difference between, if you look at the burgundy in the middle of yeah. that on the screen for everybody, it was grey. Wow. Like the okay. print, it was so wrong because they then put the hex value and they converted it. And so basically that, that was just taking a colour that they took from the website that we'd chosen to make it look good on the website they took it and printed the business cards from it and it was just totally wrong. So that's 5,000 business cards in the in the bin because we can't use them because it's the wrong colour. And yeah. it was as simple as all, all they needed to do was use this CMYK. So even if you're not technically minded enough to understand where these are useful, having this is it just saves you so much time when you go to get a business card or uh, a brochure or a tote mm. bag or a mug or a banner you know imagine printing the side of a building size poster for your inaugural event that you put on after running your coaching business for five years and it's the wrong red or it's the wrong green i mean it's yeah. just be heartbreaking wouldn't it i think the um the cmyk thing particularly something that i as part of my process that i do is i have a um a pantone cmyk book and i will check the values physically printed but printed to a professional standard to make sure they look right mm. printed because we, we work in such a digital way now you know all the design files i sent you were digital pdfs and something to be aware of things do look different on different screens but um what i do as part of my process is check that the colors i'm giving you look good printed mm. um and rather than like you say getting a digital um, you know, an RGB or a hex value converted and not knowing how it'll look. I've already done that check for you. So that's sort of in the in the guidelines. Um, yeah, and then I guess actually one of the things that's most fun about your brand is is the three shapes that we developed. Mm -hmm. And um, we, we went through a few iterations of, of how they could be used. And um, to start with, there was something that was integrated with the logo, but actually what we've gone for is something a bit more flexible and a um, sort of more interesting really and I think this is what's really nice is that you've got this toolkit of items that people will start to associate with your brand even though they're incredibly sim simple forms but um, through repetition of use but also the fact that they're so simple and bold I think it gives them real impact mm -hmm. and um, we I remember we had sort of a sheet of uh, shapes that I developed and Obviously, they're, they're quite simple, so some of the links sometimes can be a little bit abstract. But what's nice is the origin of them. So the three that we came up with, the you know, uh, the mountain, the target and the, the flower or the bloom, they all uh, reflect parts of your business or parts of your values or parts of the journey you pe take people on. So they have a really nice story behind them. And um, but from a practical design point of view, aside from the sort of origin story, if you like, we have this really flexible um, system where we can combine them in really interesting ways. 
and um so here you know you're combining the the shapes uh but also that sort of wider color palette to create mm. something that's very unique to you and that i know you've been using you know use this a lot say on your on your marketing um mm. like on your social media and it's becoming very recognizable if someone scrolling through a feed people will that will catch their eyes oh that's that's those guys you know they mm. they posted it again and and that's what you want is someone to be able to pick out your posts in a feed without reading the name you know um and that that's what it gives you but also i think this is quite fun because what i've done is created a a suite of pre-made textures with um the shapes overlapped in different ways that you guys can reuse so you've got this as we said this toolkit that you can use mm. um and, and just to and remind people different ways. Mm. uh as you said martin you know we've got the better bolder and braver which are the three different levels you can get to in your marketing Mm. Uh, that these three different shapes speak to but we also had a conversation with you about the fact that we had our community we had a a course that's a, a self-service course as we call it and then yes. also a, a program which is a very immersive course so and the other thing is that we're all about inclusivity uh, and so the ability to have these shapes be um of quite joyous colors that are all interacting and overlapping with each other was again something that kind of spoke to the sort of community that we're trying to build so on many levels having those three shapes was really important to us i just wanted to say hmm. yeah i think a lot of the things you deliver kind of overlap in um the areas they cover so it kind of makes sense from that point of view um yeah so you know it, as well as the sort of very overlapping, creating a sort of darker background. There's also a more sparse way of doing things. So you've got quite a lot of flexibility mm -hmm. within that quite small um, amount of elements we've developed, but they're quite diverse in the way that you use them or can use them. Um, yeah, and these are just different examples of the way that they can be used. Um, and I actually, yeah, I'm looking forward to seeing more of, of this kind of monolithic approach, if you like. Um, yeah, because I think it's it's so simple. It be really um, really attracts attention in it, in its simplicity. Mm. So I think it can be really strong. Um, yeah, and then uh, I just explored quickly how either the shapes could be used to crop photography, possibly. Um, and it's it's just good to see examples, really. And I, I think a good brand guidelines will um, not just set out a set of rules, but also give you a bit of inspiration for how a brand can be used. And um, accountability, because we've yeah. been lucky enough today to have you in the nicest possible way say, guys, what's going on? What about the monolithic <laughs> standalone <laughs> shapes that we stuff. talked about, which you should be using a bit more? And it's like, thank you, <laughs> sorry, thank you. It's like, check in. Well, so, it's, yeah. it's your brand. It's your brand. <laughs> no, 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 but you're absolutely uh, right. And we, we yeah. get a bit, we, we find ourselves doing the old overlap, don't we, Simon? <laughs> <laughs> but you're right. Like the monolithic sh shapes mm. should, uh, I really like. Um, I really like them too so um, yeah, I wonder right. if it's that we haven't uh, you know we're in the middle of building the third thing and when we've got mm. all three things I think we're going to be talking mm. about all three things in relationship to each other and I feel like at that point we'll probably yes be kind of reverting back to that monolith monolithic kind of iconography a bit more is what I'm yeah. imagining. Shall, shall I, um, is there anything you want to go back to or shall I close the guidelines now what do you think? Um, um, I'm just it. thinking about the sen you know the sentence that we had to draft because you made us come back and do you remember we had to um oh for um describing the three shapes so yeah, that, yeah 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 I was just I gonna go say that. that that was quite a nice sort of in in the in mind of what we said earlier about sort of having a manifesto and a and a truth <laughs> mm. yes we had to really wed ourselves to some words because mm. you said right we're gonna have to put some words in this brand guidelines and we were like can you do it and you're like no you can do it and we're like okay <laughs> and then we had to really sit down and be like right in like five words ten words mm. whatever what are we saying and uh that was useful i found mm. Yeah, I think when we were coming up with these shapes, I, um, you know, I had ideas about what icons might represent certain things. But actually, what was great is when I came came up with them, you started to read even more meaning into them, and that what that is what helped us select the final shapes. Um, 
we you know there was also visual things to consider like how they work together and whether they felt like they were although they're very different shapes whether they felt balanced in terms of shape and density um but aside from that it was interesting about these is they do have a bit of a backstory and, and yeah. a meaning and the fact that you sort of read multiple meanings into those um alongside the things that i'd thought of i think makes it a, a stronger brand because it's there's a reason for these things for being here you know it's not just because we like circles or because we like yeah. mountains but also <laughs> it's, this, it's that ongoing relationship with meaning um mm. you know we're, we're in the business of encouraging people to repurpose content of recycling things of generously cheerleading each other and you know also about sort of um having the humility to appreciate that you may well read meaning into something in a different way uh, at a different time um yes. and you know w we need to be warm to there being other ways of reading into things Mm -hmm. um, and so to be able to do that as a practice and then to be able to speak to it in your marketing is, is, is a joy. Yeah, I, th I think it is worth saying that you, there's no guarantee that other people outside of your organisation will read the same thing in. But what we try and do is give them the, the best possible chance of interpreting it in the way that we hope. But um, there will always be... Um, yeah, as I think I said right right at the at the top of the podcast, actually, is is the brand is really how people perceive you, and that's visually and how you act and how you speak, and how people think about you, and you you can't always control what people think about you, but you can give them the best start in the way that you act and the way that you you show up visually, and hopefully nudge people in the direction of the way you'd like people to think about you, you know. Um, but yeah, it, it, what I like about this is even if someone sees these shapes and they don't immediately think, oh, you know, a bloom symbolises growth and bravery, you've got a very strong reason for having them there. And it also gives you something to, to talk about. Um, you know, I, I just think that the best thing about good branding is there's a reason why every element of it is there um, mm. rather than just an arbitrary, you know, visual decision. And it's it gives it a lot more strength when there's a reason for choosing things. I think that's a beautiful note on which to invite anyone who's listening in live to ask any questions that they might have of Martine. Um, yeah, it's really good. It's, I've, it's, it's, it's been a little while since I've looked through it as a document because I've got all the elements saved in different areas. Like I've got the colour palette saved, yeah. and I've got the font saved. So actually going back to PDFs really been really been great to see it all and mm -hmm. just be like oh yeah there's yeah no, I remember those conversations and <clears throat> in some ways it feels like a long time ago because we mm. we've done so much but actually it was only you know a few months ago really wasn't it when we were <laughs> having those conversations so yeah I think also if we were to get you know we we think about whether or not what, what we're doing now is something that we could we, you know our bigger agenda is that we're trying to change the marketing conversation and at the moment we're working with coaches um and really enjoying it but we can see there are other sectors with whom we could work as effectively and would be as passionate about working with and it will be an interesting conversation that we have with you when we get to that point mm. you know and we think about you know whether or not our brand would work best to stay exactly as it is or whether or not we might like to think about switching it up in some way and how would that work in authentically standing by our original crew and working with another audience and uh, you know in the spirit of niching it's like it's okay to move forward it's okay to change yes. how are you going to give yourself permission to do that and how are you going to communicate that to people so as people iterate as businesses their brand is there to hold the hand and 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 be a backdrop against which they can move Yes, that's that's true. I think um, the important thing is probably even if your audience changes, your values should be so integral to how you work that they probably don't change much. So if you have a brand that feels very loyal to those values, then you should be able to transition pretty much from, you know, training coaches how to do great marketing to making socks as long as your values are the same your brand should transition you know of course you can relook at it and it might be that for a different um 
for a different sector, you might look at maybe changing some of the icons or the color palette slightly. But I think mm. at its core, if it reflects your values and your values are quite core to you and how you work, then um, it shouldn't be too far off the mark. Um, yeah, I don't, yeah. Mm -hmm. No, it's really <laughs> nice. good. It, make, it makes a lot of sense. I'm reading uh, Peter's comment um, mm. and for him, uh, businesses uh, standing uh, without standing out businesses about subtlety and gently feeling and mm. uh, sensitivity listening to the heart's journey and I'm reading into that the passion with which Peter is keen that his uh, his branding represents his approach to coaching yeah absolutely um, I mean obviously your brand is is very bold and and I guess yeah brush could be the way way to describe it it's very um it's very <laughs> confident it's a very confident brand but um you can absolutely create a brand that feels sensitive and subtle and gentle um in the colors that you choose the fonts that you choose and that will of course if that's the way you you run your coaching that will be reflected in how you act as well so absolutely i mean you know you've listed a few words there that would form a great a great brief in terms of you know how do you um create something that feels sort of soft and um you know and, and subtle mm. um but is still recognizable so i don't i don't think you have to be bold to be uh recognizable but you do have to be sort of consistent and choose some kind of visual cues that you can repeat that people can can recognize mm. so um yeah. yeah, I think it comes down, it comes up to that point of consistency that we raised mm. earlier. And I think it's like, even if you just choose a colour that really speaks yeah. to you and you think represents maybe a kind of colour that your clients would resonate with, then even just using that colour as a coloured underline, it could be as simple as that. Something incredibly simple that you just use. So maybe it's a very simple logo with, it's a font logo with just a, a, a splash of colour every now and then even. You could just go down that route, but then you could also go down the route of picking like a shape or something like that to represent you rather than a, a word. And there's there's all those different things to explore. Yeah. And I think there's lots of things you can do, but you don't necessarily have to go bold with it. You you, mm. you could go deep with it instead, and maybe there's yeah. something to explore around those sort of feelings there. I, I think there's something worth saying actually about the fact that um, we very deliberately didn't really include photography guidelines in your guidelines because you guys very much didn't want to use stock photography, which mm. I totally understand. Um, so we went for a very bold graphic route so that you had some visual stuff you could use that didn't require having photos. Um, and one way that you can communicate your brand is through your consistent choice of photography um, in terms of lighting or depth of field or the way the people are posed and often in, in most cases actually our brand guidelines do include some sort of photography guidelines and especially if you're on social media the way you pick photography can can have a real impact on how the brand feels as a whole so um, you can also think about how you communicate your values through the kind of photos that you pick. Mm. Mm. Yeah, it's really interesting. Yeah, I guess, yeah, from our point of view, we wanted to avoid some of the cliches that are yeah. around stock photography. And I think there probably are quite a few <clears throat> in terms of coaching. In You know, we do see a lot of them come up over and over again. Mm. Um, I mean, anything off of Unsplash just looks dated. I mean, it's... I looked it up somewhere. They've like a couple of them have got like a few hundred million uses. Wow! You know, it's just like if you type in connection, there's a there's a picture of two people holding hands. If you picture what two people holding hands look like in your head now, it's that picture off Unsplash. <laughs> it's just yes. it's everybody's seen it so much. Hmm. Um, and there's also that thing of like um, you don't want to be the kind of person who buys a frame from IKEA and doesn't put their own photo in it. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. They just leave the stock photo in it. You know. Is that kind of thing where you're like, I think stock can really like paint you into a corner to use a phrase we used earlier. Yeah, can, absolutely. Can, I mean, I, I think it can be very valuable, especially if people oh, yeah, don't yeah. have a big budget. But mm -hmm. I think you you can definitely make some rules for yourself about how you pick that photography to make sure that it feels right for you. So, for yeah. example, some pictures have a really, um, I know you're 
your listeners are, are not just from the UK, but for example, when I look at stock, one of the things that um, for my UK clients, I'm trying to avoid is is shots that look too American because mm. sometimes it's not an American flag in the background, but there's just a feel. You're just like they look like yeah. Americans yeah. in an American house. Mm. So um, even down to just making sure that if you're picking pictures, they look local <laughs> to you, mm. and or if you make a decision that you're going to take your own photos or have a shoot with a photographer, you know, um, it's mm. just about being consistent and, and true to to your brand, I suppose. Also, yeah. I think it gives people permission to be a bit creative. I mean, there are some wonderful people we're surrounded with who are excellent at, but amateur illustrators. Mm. And there's so many amazing things out there that tools that allow you to be creative and not have to use photography or yeah, absolutely. You know, so yeah, that's I mean, okay as well. <laughs> yeah, you can you could define a sort of like an illustration style that yeah. you use, or maybe you've got you know a little bit of skill in sort of drawing diagrams or little cartoons that get your ideas across and that's part of your style it becomes recognizable you know um so there's lots of ways you can things you can do to avoid using photography um but if you are using it yeah it's good to have some sort of ground rules for how you pick them so that they feel consistent or even just using as you've um shown us in the brand guidelines how you can use photography in your brand so that it looks different from just a photograph you know you can cut out your yeah the way you, or yeah like a different you know yeah. it whether it's black and like white or the photo. way you crop yeah, yeah or something exactly. like that that enables you to brand photography so exactly. that it, you it's ownable in a way yeah because yeah. you give it some of your own brand flavor yeah i'm mindful of time if anyone's got any questions now is the time but otherwise um and you know, the elephant in the room for people might be that uh, they're quite interested to know how much it might cost to work with you. And, you know, we're not wanting to put you on the spot at all, but also being able to be quite transparent, we mm. can share, you know, how much we paid for your services. But I don't know if that's quite the way you'd like to go about talking about how you, you know, it's, I think that's a question for people though, isn't it? Do you want to I'm, I'm to sure it is, yeah. I mean, uh, how much does branding cost is kind of a, how long is a piece of string question? Mm. But um, what I would say is that, you know, there are there's a whole scale of things we can do from something quite basic where we perhaps don't do a full workshop, but there's a questionnaire and a conversation that cuts cost. And then in terms of deliverables, um, you can keep things lean to keep things more affordable. So, you know, our, our brand packages can range anything from um, roughly £1,500 to sort of £10,000. Um, and it really depends on the deliverables, how prescriptive you need us to be. Do you need templates for different things? And, you know, the more prescriptive and the more detailed you are, the more the cost gets added. Um, but something we also try and do is um, we try and keep things lean by not con not designing um, lots of a scattergun approach, if you like, because a lot of designers will design, you know, four things for you to choose from. But those four yeah. things, you've done them all before you have any feedback. And the way we do our design is definitely a collaboration. So what we do is we do a lot of listening and fact finding at the start. And that first option, um, we get feedback from you. If it's not right, then we look at another one. That means that when we're doing any second or third options, it's done with the additional information of your feedback. So that kind of keeps things lean in a way because we're not wasting time coming up with lots of ideas before we've even heard what you think about about the first thing we did. So that yeah. can um, some that makes some people feel a little bit uncomfortable because they think, oh, I'm just going to get one thing. And, you know, uh, people feel comfortable with lots of options. But the great thing is, is that it involves more collaboration. So mm -hmm. you can be more lean because you're putting all of your time into into the things that are working rather than creating lots of things at the start if you like yeah that's yeah. really good idea. Really um good. rob's asking an excellent question which is do you offer a brand audit or review for people yes we do yeah it's something that we charge for but we definitely um review people's current brand against how they want to be seen and then sort of offer a perspective on that and perhaps identify things that are working well or not so well and then we can help you come up with a plan for how you might tackle that. So that's definitely something that, that we do and would suggest if you have an existing brand and uh, perhaps have an inkling that it's not quite right or something's not quite working. That's definitely something that is, is a good thing to do. Awesome, thank you. Excellent. Yeah, that's really good. Well, thank you for 
joining us and sharing uh, all of your wonderful knowledge, Martine. It's been really great to go through that, relive that process again. Uh, <laughs> and it's and, lovely um, that we yeah. have the rare occasion to actually be really explicit with people about what the signs and symbols in mm. our mm. Uh, brand actually mean. Because as you say, people may or may not ever know, but we've had this opportunity with you to actually share publicly our thinking behind the brand so thank you for the opportunity to do that no problem yeah well you know it, it was a really fun one for me to work on because you gave me such a, a, a creative freedom on it but it's just it's just great fun working with people who are very enthusiastic about what they do and that rubs off on me as a designer and hopefully we do better work as a result of working for people who are excited to be mm. to be working on something so well you never know you might have a couple of coaches giving you a call after this <laughs> well, I'd, I'd very certainly welcome very that. enthusiastic yeah. uh very passionate and very emotionally in tune individuals uh which mm. is why we enjoy working with coaches so much but i dare say you would also i'm sure very much enjoy working with anyone that we do so um, yeah if you i guess uh you know we can post in the chat here where people can find you actually simon is in the middle of doing that but is there anywhere in particular or uh do you have any preferences for how people yeah i think um ironically for a design company we've been so busy over the last few years our, our own website isn't particularly developed but you can see um a good place to find us is on instagram or um or me personally on linkedin and i'm happy for people to get in touch if they have any other questions about branding so lovely thanks so, it's such both a of those yes thank you <laughs> yeah i've put both of those links in the chat they'll also be in the show notes if you are listening to the podcast so you can get in touch with uh martine do give a a follow on instagram because it's um yeah yeah it's good they're always putting out some really interesting stuff and the work it's I, one thing I do like is when you find a good designer and then you work with them and then you watch all the other great stuff they put out you're like oh wow that's really good and you get to learn about all the other different customers as well um, and having run an agency for a long time um, it's really interesting to just keep seeing what work and brands and things and how those ideas develop so um, excellent well thank you very much um, for joining us Martine and thank, thank you, you. Thank you, everybody, for listening and watching. And we will see you next time. Next time. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.